Okay, good evening and a very welcome, warm welcome to this International Women's Day event uh, focused on the theme of women as key players in the centralized renewable energy sector, beneficiary leaders and innovators. That was organized in joint collaboration with, with ARENA, Power for All, and GWNet, the Global Women's Network for the Energy Transition. So together we come uh, today to celebrate uh, women's uh, social, uh, cultural, economic, political achievements, and call for gender equality, obviously. Um, the International Women's Day is a day to reflect, of course, on the progress that was made, uh, to advocate for change, and to celebrate the courage and determination of, of women who have played a, a, an amazing role in, uh, in their countries and community's history. Um, this year's event has a particular focus, which is the role of women in decentralized renewables. Uh, obviously, renewables have become an increasingly important uh, element in addressing climate change and, and, and ensuring energy access for all. Um, but uh, in particular, decentralized renewables can transform lives, uh, especially for those living in very urban, rural and remote areas. <clears throat> But we also know that the, 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 the sector is not fully uh, utilizing the talents and the skills of, uh, of women. They continue to be underrepresented as uh, beneficiaries, uh, leaders, innovators, uh, despite the potential uh, that they have in contributing to, to, to the growth of the sector and its development. Um, this event aims to increase awareness on the role of women in the sector and explore the ways uh, by which we can increase involvement of women in the industry. Uh, we will hear uh, from experts in the field uh, who, share, who will share experiences of women becoming key players in the sector. Of course, the successes, but also the challenges. We will obviously also examine the ecosystem in terms of the policy and the regulatory environments, looking at how gender consideration can be integrated uh, into energy policies um, and how women can be supported to access finance and build their capacity uh, in the sector. Obviously, as we celebrate this uh, important uh, day, International Women's Day, we also need to remember that gender equality is not just a, a women's issue, but a human rights issue that affects us all. And so we should celebrate also, in addition to women, the men uh, who have worked uh, as allies and uh, ensure together that, uh, that women have equal opportunities and can contribute to the sector's growth and development. So thank you for joining us today. And we hope that this event will inspire all of us uh, to take more action. I will give the floor to uh, my dear colleague, Celia Garcia Banos, who has been leading the work on gender over the past years, and she will be setting the scene. Then Carolina Pan, director of uh, At Power for All, will follow to present uh, main findings from their, their efforts to assess the employment in the, uh, in, in, uh, in the sector and the role of, of women in it. Um, to, then to continue, we will have Christine Lenz from uh, GWNet who will moderate um, a very interesting uh, panel of distinguished speakers to increase further awareness uh, uh, of the role of women in, in decentralized renewables and explore ways to increase their involvement in the industry. Thank you very much for joining us and uh, I look forward to listening to the different uh, interventions. The floor is yours, Celia. Thank you very much, Fabia. Thank you everybody for joining today. Happy International Women's Day. Um, I want to start saying that we have witnesses that the transformative changes in the energy sector, the transition to renewable energy distributed and decarbonized energy systems is creating an array of opportunities, particularly including jobs. In this sense, according to our latest uh, Renewable Energy and Jobs Annual Review Analysis, the industry has surpassed 12.7 million people working in the field, with solar PV being one of the highest, the highest uh, technology in terms of employment. This, of course, includes a lot of opportunities and a lot of uh, jobs on decentralized solar solutions. However, the renewable energy and the broad 
their energy industry keeps employing more men than women. We have our analysis part of the Renewable Energy Agenda Perspective series that we can see that unfortunately women still account for only about a third of the renewable energy workforce, while it's still faring better than the conventional energy sector that is uh, even lower at the 22%, it's still lagging behind from the economy-wide percentage. Our latest survey analysis shows that solar PV scores better with 40% of the workforce being women, driven in part by decentralized energy solutions. In this sense, renewable energy and decentralized renewable energy in particular offer an unprecedented opportunity to transform the energy sector in all aspects. And to ensure these opportunities are equally accessible and equitably distributed, we need to understand the barriers that exist for women. That's why our analysis also focuses on this. In particular, in the access sector where energy is still being established or expanded, the, our survey revealed that the most commonly cited barrier were cultural and social norms, followed by the lack of skills and gender specific training opportunities and the lack of gender sensitive programs and uh, policies. It was also flagged that the inequality in this asset ownership was an issue. Interesting, uh, we can see that cultural and social norms is a barrier that is mostly cited in by respondents in Europe and North America, while respondents from other regions were more likely to select that the lack of skills and training was the challenge that women face. But there are, however, plenty of opportunities for women to participate in the sector. The decentralized nature of renewal actually brings a lot of opportunities and energy choices for household community at the community level where women tend to have a greater voice. Women can participate in the consultation and planning, in construction, operations, and through development of productive uses. Several success examples of women's engagement in the energy sector have brought about great improvement in women's self-perception and empowerment with their, their communities. We're gonna listen to this more in the panel. So in conclusion, to engender the energy transition, particularly in the decentralized renewable energy sector, we need to ensure that gender is mainstream in the sector at all levels, not only by gathering and reporting gender disaggregated data, but also ensuring that gender is audited in all projects and policies. We need to ensure that training and skills development are tailored specifically to strengthen the role of women. We also have to ensure that attracting and retaining talent in the sector through policies in the access sector in this uh, context, efforts beyond the skills and training can include access to financing and markets. But altogether, we have to challenge the cultural and social norms, so strengthen the visibility of the diverse roles of women and helping them to become agents of social and economic transformation to influence perception of gender roles. With all this, I want to finalize saying that we have all our publications available in irena.org slash publications, and we're happy to for people to read it. Carolina now will give us some insights on Powers for All work. Thank you, Carolina. The floor is yours. Thank you, Celia, very much. Uh, thanks, Irina, for the invitation. And hi, everyone. My name is Carolina Pan. I'm the research director at Power for All. We are a global campaign to accelerate the end of energy poverty through the use of decentralized renewable energy solutions. Um, and when it comes to energy poverty, there's you know, substantial evidence now that it is not gender neutral. Women bear most of the costs of the lack of energy access. And this is because they do more household chores that require you know, more um, um, things to be performed manually, or they are more exposed to air pollution uh, from cooking fuels, which has terrible health effects. Um, and then when it comes to employment, it is also not a surprise that women face more barriers to finding a job than men. Um, even when there's a lot of evidence that a more diverse and a more balanced workforce has a lot of benefits to the companies from you know increasing their financial and operational performance to reducing their risks be, be it financial risks reputational risks and for these reasons we were very pleased to see and this is both from you know the arena's jobs report that uh, Celia was just uh, talking about as well as our own research that we within the overall energy sector which is by the way, very male dominated, 
um, GRE, and this is mostly driven by solar PV, is the, has the largest share of women in the workforce. Um, and this is about 40% worldwide uh, per IRENA's numbers. Uh, we get similar estimates. So uh, last year, we actually released the Powering Jobs Census 2022, which was our second census. And it's a bottom-up count of um, employment in the DRE sector. And um, our findings suggest that women actually have been an integral part of the DRE success story. While numbers vary substantially across countries, what we have seen is an overall growth in the uh, participation of women in the DRE workforce, at least comparing our 2019 census to our 2022 census. We do observe that Sub-Saharan African countries um, are more female friendly than India, for instance, when it comes to employment. And our best in class is Kenya that exhibits, exhibits the highest female participation at 41%. And this is actually, these numbers are very encouraging because this is actually uh, showcases a massive growth from 2019 where female participation was at 23%. So this is an 18 percentage point um, increase in just a few years. And this mostly happened during COVID, which is not entirely a surprise because we have shown in our report too that the sector has been super resilient through COVID much more than any other sector in the economy. Uh, but still obviously great news. Um, we also find that wage differences in the DRE sector are smaller than national wage differences for many countries. And probably one of the most interesting things um, that came up, and this was in our focus groups discussions and expert interviews was that we were able to gather some anecdotal evidence of women being super successful uh, in their you know, sales roles, um, outselling men significantly, but also like great stories of women entrepreneurs uh, driving in the uh, thriving in the sector. And this is obviously great news in a sector that is one, very sales driven, uh, but also a sector that's very fast growing. Um, well, all of this is obviously encouraging and you know, uh, it seems like we're moving in the right direction. We're obviously very, still very far from gender parity. Um, and, and if you take Kenya, like our best in class as an example, it is still almost 10 percentage points behind uh, gender parity. And this is not just in the number of jobs, but this is also obviously in wages. And it's in the type of roles uh, that you know women perform. They are over women are overrepresented in administrative tasks and support functions, and underrepresented in technical functions or leadership positions. Um, as Celia was just saying, there are all, there's still also a lot of barriers, and many of those are cultural that inhibit the full participation of women in the sector and it is very important that we address those especially with a fast growing population that means a lot of young women that are going to be entering uh, the labor force in the near future so we need to do more um, and i think that a good way to help is not just by raising awareness of the existing inequities which is great and we should keep doing uh, but also by sharing the success stories and this is not just uh, how women um, how female employment has helped women, but also how women have helped the sector uh, grow and develop. And I'm going to stop here, but I'm, you know, I will happily answer any questions uh, at, at the end. So um, thanks so much. And Christine, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Carolina. Good morning, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we are very glad to also have you here. Uh, because we also need you uh, as agents of change to uh, to drive this uh, energy transition forward and uh, to to get women uh, the deserved uh, participation in this sector. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, moderate this distinguished panel that Arena has uh, put together for uh, this side event, uh, which I think is very timely uh, for this year's International Women's Day which is under the topic of digital innovation and technology for gender equality. And uh, my name is Christine Linz. I'm the executive director of GWNet, the Global Women's Network for the Energy Transition, a non-for-profit international association, 
with over 3,300 members from 140 plus countries open uh, to you all. Uh, so uh, we, we look forward to, to connecting further. And uh, without any further ado, I'm going to uh, just start uh, this uh, distinguished panel today. As you see, we have uh, seven speakers. So we have quite an interesting program uh, listed up for you. Uh, we uh, are first of all having uh, a discussion in, within the panel, but should you have any burning questions as uh, as audience, please uh, type them in the in the chat, uh, put them uh, in the in the uh, in the Q and A, uh, and we will try to address them as much as we can during the panel. Or uh, if this is not possible, then we will uh, do this afterwards. I invite all panelists to uh, switch on their cameras and microphones. And I will not now introduce you all, but I will introduce you just uh, as I give you the floor. And I would like to start uh, by inviting uh, Avishek Mala, Energy Specialist at ECMOD, uh, to open our discussion here. Uh, Carolina has uh, referred to it that women are often uh, exposed uh, to, to um, uh, uh, different uh, um, uh, health uh, issues uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, producing energy in the air pollution, etc. In what ways can decentralized renewable energy improve women's uh, access to healthcare services in rural and, and remote areas? Uh, any take on this uh, from you, Avikesh, Avishek, sorry. Thank you, Christine, um, and uh, happy International Women's Day to all. Um, and it's a very important topic. And uh, well, what I'd like to do is uh, share one of my experiences uh, on this. So, um, you know, a couple of years ago, I was visiting a, a, a ruler a government health post in Western Nepal. And uh, this health post was located, you know, around like two and a half uh, hours walk from the nearest motorable road. And it was serving around 2000 people and on an average 40 births uh, per year. So upon reaching that health post, uh, I was greeted by the health in charge, Sunita, I remember her name, and she took me around the facility. And uh, and the facility was, you know, like very basic old buildings, uh, few furnitures, no medical equipments, no electricity. And it was even more shocking to me uh, that this facility was primarily, you know, serving as a birthing center. Um, and as a father who has seen, uh, who has witnessed his own daughter uh, delivery and subsequently admission to NICU, um, neonatal intensive care unit, I couldn't help wonder how safe it was for women uh, to give birth here. Um, then I asked Sunita how she managed to conduct safe deliveries and address any life-threatening complications with such limited resources. And she explained that the facility could only handle minor issues and uh, had to refer more serious cases to the district uh, headquarter hospital. I couldn't imagine uh, the pressure she must have faced um, knowing that there is no backup plan for any emergency cases. And, and then she started like sharing, um, you know, a few incidents with me uh, that left me all with her skills and determination. In one uh, delivery case, which was done during the night, uh, she had to use the light of her mobile phone uh, and holding in, uh, in her mouth uh, because the facility had no electricity. And due to this, she was unable to give any instructions to the mother and she had to solely rely on her instincts to, to deliver the baby. And as she recounted the incident, um, I realized how important reliable electricity was uh, for even you know, the most basic uh, medical procedures. Uh, but the challenge didn't end there. Um, you know, she told me that there was this time where she had to give mouth to mouth to a newborn. And uh, it was then when I realized like, you know, how much a simple piece of, you know, medical equipment like oxygen concentrator, nebulizer, or even a MB bag um, can really make, you know, um, difference in saving lives. Um, so as I was, you know, as I left the, the, the health post that day, I couldn't stop thinking about the incredible work that Sunita and her team was, you know, doing there 
And I knew that they needed more support, and especially in terms of reliable electricity and uh, appropriate medical equipments. It was clear that um, decentralized renewable energy systems uh, can help provide more reliable um, energy to these remote um, healthcare centers as a primary source of energy or backup or both, um, ensuring um, safe birth facilities for mother and children in the most challenging circumstances. And uh, if we have time for the next question, I will like to talk about how then the partnership was formed among the government, uh, civil society organization and private sector um, to bring power to this health post. Okay, I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Abhishek, for, for sharing this very personal story uh, uh, with us. And I think you touched upon an important point. You know, technology is there and it's all about scaling it up and, uh, and we'll for sure uh, later on come back uh, to, uh, to, to discussing how, how this can be done. But I would like uh, now to, to give the floor to everybody on the panel and then we can, we can come back to this. Uh, another important issue is uh, obviously uh, training and skills that are required uh, for um, for finding jobs in this field. Uh, and there I would like to give the floor to Carol Weiss, uh, who is the co-founder of Remote Energy. Remote Energy is working to develop uh, solar te technical curricula and uh, training solar educators. Maybe you can tell us a little bit more about your work and how women are benefiting, Carol. Thank you, Christine, and thank you, Irina, for um, organizing this important discussion. Um, remote energy, what we do, our mission is to train and mentor solar educators and technicians. And we're really focusing on populations that are underrepresented in the PV industry. And so uh, women uh, is a big target population that we work with, trying to get more women in the PV industry. And we're teaching, we're doing that through teaching technical classes. And so when I think about trying to increase the number of women to hold the jobs for all of those millions of jobs that are going to be available in clean energy in the next coming years, um, my mind goes to the classroom because I am trained as an electrician, but I also have been teaching solar technical classes for the last 20 years. And so naturally I go to um, think of the classroom. I'm going to show a few photos. Um, Christine, can you see my slide well? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so this is a picture and it's a dark picture because I'm in Sierra Leone and the electricity had just gone out, but I was teaching a solar technical class. And I am in front of the room as a woman and there's one other woman in the class. And this is a typical solar classroom for the last 20 years that I've taught around the world is that mainly cla solar classrooms are comprised of men. Um, now, when you hold a women's specific solar class, women show up for those classes. And um, we have data that shows that we can increase the numbers by two to five fold of women's participation in solar programs if we offer all female classes as well as co-ed classes. So in our global women's program, we offer classes that are for women, taught by women, and so um, you'll see that we have a classroom, this is in Kenya, we have a classroom full of women. These are uh, women that are training to be trainers. Um, and we are mentoring and we're doing a long-term mentorship with the educators that are in front of the room because they're the people that are going to increase the numbers in their region and in their community. Now in the last IRENA gender perspectives report, um, I found it very interesting that they dialed down to the PV installation workforce and women only represent 12% of that workforce. And you know, to increase that number, we have to, uh, and what we do in our women's program is we focus on real marketable skills that make women competitive in the PV industry. And so those are skills such as what is the personal protective equipment that you need for the job you're doing? How do you use a digital multimeter? How do you set up a ladder safely and climb to the top of the roof? Um, and then once you're on the roof, how are you installing all of your modules? Because those are gonna, those modules are warranted for 25 years so that the wind doesn't blow them off so that we don't have leaks in our roof, you know, installing racking and micro inverters, et cetera. Now I wanna point out in these two photos, 
these are at um, schools where the mock, these are mock-up roofs where the roof is really low to the ground. It's only up to two meters at the highest point. And so we're, do, we're building these um, systems so that uh, classes and students can learn these marketable skills in a safe manner. Um, and we find that this is really scalable um, in our women's program because we are starting with the teachers. And so on the left-hand picture, this is Lisa, she's Navajo, she teaches at the Northwest Indian College and she's taking the class as a student at first, but then now she is in a, co a mentoring phase where she's co-teaching classes with us and she's bringing the solar training into her, in her engineering classes and co-teaching classes to as workforce development in her community. And why we believe that it's the most important to um, focus on the women educators in front of the room. If you remember that first photo I showed you uh, where I was one of the only women in the room, that was a train the trainers class. And in Sierra Leone from seven vocational schools, they only had one woman in that whole classroom that was from a technical college at, that taught at a technical college because most of the trainers are men. Now, when we're looking at how are we gonna get the next generation of women excited about solar, having women in front of the room as a role model so that young women can see themselves and say, oh, this is a pathway for me. We're trying to focus on changing that dynamic in the classroom. This is a picture of Marie Danielle. She came out of our solar educator program last year from Cameroon and she's teaching a class. Um, but they immediately, that women's group went, uh, taught a community class right after our educational program. And so then my, oops, I, I skipped. Let me go back. Can you, uh, can you see this photo? Yes, we can. Um, Okay, so this last photo that I have is just showing last year in Kenya, we had an all women's hands on class. And this year, uh, this week, we're having another class in Kenya. And I kind of just like to show this as the new face of the solar industry, that we really believe that this is scalable by doing gender specific trainings, we're reducing one of the barriers that arena has seen, um, we're changing that cultural social norm by making sure that all women are, are in a safe, uh, feeling a comfortable environment. And uh, we're doing, we are uh, moving to Tanzania and uh, Uganda and Liberia this year as our new solar educator uh, organizations. And we're looking for other partners as if you know of other women that want to, or people that want to increase the number of women in the solar industry in their area. Uh, we would love to be in contact with them. Thank you very much, Carol, uh, for showing us the new face of the solar industry. Really, really <laughs> nice and really impressive. And also for putting the cursor on the importance of, of training and skills development. Uh, let me now move on to the next panelist, Christine Alpsinger, uh, who is program director of the Shine Campaign. Uh, and uh, I have a question uh, to you, Christine, about uh, the main barriers for women who want to become entrepreneurs. We have seen at GWNet that this is often an issue. We have done a role models campaign for female women energy entrepreneurs in the energy sector uh, a couple of years ago. But maybe you can share a bit more insights what you consider the main barriers for women to set up their businesses in the energy sector. Sure. Thank you, Christine, and, and uh, good to see everyone on the, the panel here, and happy International Women's Day to everyone. It's a, it's a great day to reflect on, on where we've been and where we're going. Um, my experience, and I've been working in the world of energy access finance for uh, close to 30 years, and the barriers, quite frankly, haven't changed all that much, although the barrier breakers are beginning to really develop and be much more available. Uh, to women entrepreneurs. I think if I could summarize the barriers in one word, it would be access. It's access to information about the opportunities of, that are available in the energy, energy space, um, access to understanding, as, as it was just described uh, by the previous speakers, access to understanding of the jobs and the availability in the space, uh, of the uses of energy, uh, decentralized renewable energy technology. So the first piece of it is access to information, access to the awareness of what some of the opportunities are. Then the other piece of access, one that we hear often is access to finance. 
And in the access to finance space, there's a couple of elements in there. One is the access to the investment readiness skills to actually be able to take the idea and package it in a way that investors or funders uh, would be interested in. So in order to access that finance, there's, an, there's a need to actually access the investment readiness skills, access the business planning, access the understanding of what it takes to build a team. So that really comes very much into different but similar capacity building uh, as, as Carol just explained, you know, you have to, you have to enable, you have to empower women through skills training. And then the last, you know, the, the second, I shouldn't say the last access piece, but the third access piece is that access to finance, which is enhanced by the awareness of the opportunity, enhanced by the uh, uh, access to the capacity building, the skills, the mentorship, number of wonderful mentorship programs that GWNet has been involved in on both the electricity and the clean cooking side of, of, of energy. And then there's the access to the market. And that one is, is challenging in the sense because it hits some of the, what Carolina gave us in the overview, that hits some of those cultural and social norm barriers. Is Does the woman have access to the respect, to the dignity, to the ability to function within the particular environment within which she's fostering her business. So that access kind of hits very multiple dimensions. And I think what's, while those are all challenges, what I believe we can point to is a series of solutions that are being launched in the world we live in today in terms of energy access. Clearly, there's been advances on the tailoring of programs for women entrepreneurs. Um, there's some interesting work out there by Get Invest, interesting, the, the, the Investment Readiness Program, the Finance Catalyst Program, which has a particular emphasis on identifying, finding, and, and bringing in women entrepreneurs who can then be trained, can be, their capacity and awareness could be built in terms of how to structure and run a business. You've got more programs out there that are specific to uh, seeking out women-led energy enterprises and working with them on access to finance. A couple of them to mention here, the Opus Low Cost uh, Enterprise Fund launched a program recently called Restart Catalyst, which is targeted specifically to women-led entrepreneurs or women-led enterprises. You've got uh, entities such as Open, uh, which launched a program of, I think about a month or so ago, again, targeted specifically to women entrepreneurs, women project developers in the energy space. The US Africa Development Foundation launched a call specific to women entrepreneurs in, in off-grid energy access. And so there's an acknowledgement that there's some value to identifying defined programs for now to jumpstart women and entrepreneurs. The reality is at the end of the day, we want a systemic change so that women entrepreneurs are in the same mix as men entrepreneurs, because we believe that women entrepreneurs can be equal to or even better uh, deliveries, uh, delivery channels of energy access to their communities. But at this juncture, the reality is there are some separate programs being established to jumpstart that and give the demonstration about the power of women entrepreneurs to, to deliver and succeed in the energy enterprise space. One last comment, uh, because I'm anxious to hear from, from the other panelists on these many topics, is there, there are, through the gender lens investing world, we are seeing some very specific criteria being developed uh, coming out of 2X Global, uh, formerly known as the 2X Challenge, where you're actually seeing the larger development finance institutions and others integrating within to their investment criteria, criteria very specific on women, whether those women in as, as the leaders of the enterprises or projects that they'll be investing in, women in terms of the number of staff, the number of employees, the number of management, and then ultimately the number of customers uh, who actually receive those services and very specific targets. So I think we're seeing some very defined responses to the barriers that I mentioned, which are really about access, uh, 
But at this juncture, they're not systemic. They're, they're not really long-term change, but they're the starts and the beginnings of us making movements towards women being on equal footing in terms of delivering energy access for electricity and clean cooking. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christine. Yes, indeed. Uh, it's, it's all about scaling up and it's also all about giving, providing role models because, um, you know, if, if women can inspire others, I think uh, that's a powerful way to then uh, follow suit. But, but of course, there is still a lot that needs to be done. I'm now moving uh, to the to the recruitment side because we've heard it and uh, Irina's analysis shows it. Currently, there are about 12.7 million people employed globally in the renewable sector. This number is supposed to increase to about 42 million by 2050, with lots of jobs uh, in also in the decentralized area. And uh, I'm uh, I'm turning to uh, Chiara Remascheid. Uh, director of Futures Shortlist, um, and uh, and to your insights about how can the sector think about the recruitment process so that it empowers women to launch a career in the distributed renewable energy space. Any any thoughts on this, Chiara? Great. Yes, thank you, Christine. Um, and it was wonderful to hear everybody's comments so far, and I'm excited to hear what everybody else has to say um, on International Women's Day. Um, yeah, and just maybe to help frame this, so for anyone who doesn't know Shortlist, um, we basically design, uh, design and implement large-scale talent programs across Africa, typically focused on youth and entry-level jobs and partnerships with donors, um, governments, enterprises, and different educational institutions. Um, and we try to pair our recruitment expertise with our software platform to sort of reduce the friction um, and, and challenges that exist in sort of placing um, women in particular right in these last mile jobs um, by providing on the job work experience, um, promoting more inclusive hiring practices, um, all of which we hope right is um, unlocking growth for critical sectors like clean energy at scale. Um, and by way of example, I'd like to kind of talk about um, a partnership we have with the Global Energy Alliance for People and Planet um, and Value for Women, um, where we're where we've launched a program called Women for Green Jobs. And um, this program was really conceptualized out of this understanding that women are underrepresented across the DRE value chain and that without sort of a focused intervention, right, the status quo would persist um, and we won't, um, it, and we maybe aren't uh, reaching these targets for parity as quickly as we'd like to. And so the goals of this are several, but I think the top line objectives are that we're first, um, you know, placing 750 women into um, DRE sector jobs for over 40 DRE companies operating um, in six countries in Africa. Um, we're doing this through the use of um, a time bound subsidy model, um, hoping to you know, sort of get employers interested in hiring these women um, by de-risking their investment with um, less work experience by giving these women then you know, on, um, on-site job training and then realistic work experience that they can either carry forward if for some reason they aren't retained in these roles um, or and in most cases, what we see is actually really high retention rates, which is really encouraging to, to see. Um, and we're now a year into this program. And I think some of the key things we found um, so far um, have to do first sort of with a shift in the sector. And I think one of the key things we've seen is that a lot of the roles in DRE have to do with um, sort of um, sales-based roles in rural areas. And um, these roles um, typically are hard to recruit for for women because they do sort of um, have some unattractive job features in terms of safety. Women are often concerned about traveling alone or unaccompanied by themselves, um, going door to door in rural locations to sell products. Um, and then there's you know lots of sort of social and cultural norms um, around sort of their role and position in doing that, how their husbands might feel about that, and how their families might feel about that. Um, but one of the things that we found is that um, companies in the DRE sector are actually shifting those roles as well from sort of salary-based roles to more commission-based roles. And what's, what this has meant is that um, sort of on top of those um, initial challenges and, and when it comes to recruiting women into sort of this high volume um, potential role is that they're now also facing um, the potential of not um, being given like a good quality um, and decent job. And so um, I think for us as a sector, as we're thinking about, you know, where are the, where are the opportunities and our leverage points to really sort of 
push women into this at scale, um, we need to also question, you know, are we thinking about placing women into roles that A, um, speak to what they're interested in doing, um, are going to be supportive of them and their, you know, bodily autonomy, um, and as well as sort of providing for them and their families and communities. Um, but I think um, maybe on like a happier note, the other sort of key um, insight we found in this first year is that, um, as I mentioned, we have this wage subsidy model. Um, and while these um, play a really important part of the program, um, and, and they have a sort of proven um, success in, in facilitating women into the DRE sector, we're not actually finding that they're the primary or, or even the most important lever of impact in terms of getting women into these jobs. Um, what we found really is that this sort of de-risking of the stipend um, is really just helping us sort of get in um, with companies to sort of start having those conversations about how we can help them to attract female talent, um, recruit female talent, and then retain that talent um, within their companies. Um, and so what we're sort of seeing is that these wage subsidies when combined with, you know, an active cultivation um, of this public good pipeline of female candidates um, alongside more equitable hiring practices and sort of more resources, um, that there is potential for sort of more um, uh, broad and sustainable impact. And so our goal really is to try to maximize these benefits. And in the second year of the program, potentially scale down further the subsidy model, then be able to use the existing grant funding for other um, sort of more under-resourced areas of programs in, turn of, uh, in terms of raising awareness or reaching harder to reach women in more nascent markets um, that aren't currently sort of um, being filled into roles at, at as high rates as you might be seeing in Kenya, for example. Thank you very much, Kiara, uh, for these insights uh, showing us, you know, what you do to, to make sure to attract more female talent uh, to this DRE sector, something that that is indeed really important. Let me now turn to Dipti Vagela, who is network manager of Hydro uh, Empowerment Network. Um, and the question I have for you, uh, Dipti, would be that the availability of resources from small scale hydro can decrease women's burdens and vulnerabilities and can help in the advancement of gender equality and the empowerment of rural women as leaders and economic agents of change. Uh, can you tell us what is needed to ensure that women are really benefiting from uh, new or existing projects? Yeah, thank you for the opportunity to be on this panel with very familiar and inspiring voices. Um, yeah, the, to give you a short brief on what, what we do, uh, we are a knowledge exchange and advocacy platform for local practitioners of community scale hydropower. And we uh, work directly uh, with um, practitioners on the ground who are partnering with rural communities to strengthen their water, energy, and ecosystem nexus so that they can not only uh, generate energy access, um, water security, but also strengthen those natural resources. And so, yeah, as you mentioned, um, the, the catchment area of our projects can benefit women in so many different ways. And um, looking at examples from various parts of, of the developing South, uh, from Nicaragua, Pakistan, from uh, Mindanao in the Philippines, um, as well as Nepal and several other countries where our members come from, a few things come out clearly. One is that, um, each community is different, and uh, with the role of women and the presence of women are, are diverse in these situations. But what is common among the methods of these members is to form social formations, or you know, the word institutionalization can describe it, but it's more. It's about really facilitating uh, a mindful change at the community level and figuring out what is an appropriate and gender cultural sensitive way to start involving women. So when I started in the sector 20 years ago, uh, as you know, a person who looks Indian, um, but I, I grew up in the West, in the US, going into communities of rural Orissa, um, actually in that culture, it, 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 women did have um, somewhat leading roles, especially in indigenous communities, but in other parts of the country, 
Um, women, yeah, they were not coming out for the meetings, you know, even if you wanted uh, equal representation. We have to build the, the confidence of the women themselves. And so um, I had a bit of an advantage that I looked like them and could be there. And um, just even the act of having a woman hold a screwdriver, I remember generated a huge impact in how, how she perceived things. And, and you know, a week or two later, when we completed the training, she had kept the, the training kit in the same trunk, locked trunk of where her uh, wedding jewelry was kept. So it, it showed the, um, the impact of how enabling women to build the skills to have, um, to develop, to, to bring development to their own communities, um, builds their confidence. But to um, go back to some of the other methods that our, our members use, uh, one is, uh, so on the management side of the project, in establishing uh, not just committees, but actually micro enterprise groups that can not only um, voice in on the governance of the project, but also generate a productive, uh, very well organized productive end use. So for example, our exceptional uh, partner in Mindanao, Yamag Renewable Energy Development Group, um, has actually established coffee, a uh, coffee, they facilitated the community and the women's group to establish a coffee cooperative, a coffee enterprise that's now, I mean, within a few months of the system being commissioned is generating monthly profit for, for the group. And this, um, the income is being used to, to, to fund other social services in the community. Our, our member in Pakistan actually has women as shareholders of the project of these mini hydro, much larger facilities. Um, in Nicaragua, there is uh, the Ated um, BL um, uh, group that is uh, combining watershed practice with uh, watershed restoration with uh, women's groups there. And I can go into more details, but, but the key uh, challenges have been is challenges and and opportunities are the as as um, Christine had mentioned access to um, finance appropriate finance and you know um, now it's it's now 2023 and by 2030 we it is estimated that we will still have 650 million people without electricity and a couple of billion without clean cooking access. So we really need to think about how can we accelerate the access of finance for these activities. Um, and I, I will, I look forward to hearing from other panelists on, on this thought. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dipti, for, for sharing uh, these, these examples uh, all around the world, these best practices, uh, really inspiring. But then of course, also for bringing us back to the reality that there's still a, a long way uh, to go. And uh, and now I would like to move to Esther Wanza, who is a business analyst at the Kenya Climate Innovation Center. Uh, on the one hand, uh, Esther, this year's uh, theme for International Women's Day is innovation and technology for gender equality. This is especially important for young people. And uh, we are really excited to have you as a tech woman uh, fellow 2022 with us. So I would like to hear from you what... Uh, Digit all uh, needs to be achieved, especially in the DRE context, and uh, what you think should be the priority for governments to support young women in the DRE context. Uh, any thoughts on, on, on these points? Thank you so much, uh, Christine, and uh, for Raina, Paul, and Gannett for inviting me to this web webinar and for recognizing the youth voices uh, as far as uh, when we are celebrating this day of, uh, is uh, concerned. Uh, as a young woman and uh, someone who has experienced energy access challenges and uh, having worked with most communities to advance access to clean cooking technologies here in Kenya. Uh, I've experienced so many uh, situations where you meet women in communities and especially those in most rural areas who 
no fear or no literal about these technologies. And this comes whenever you are going to contact uh, a training on clean cooking or on solar. You find that uh, women don't want to take up that task. They they fear getting involved because of uh, maybe the social cultural uh, which has been uh, so much in our communities, and they fear that they they, they recognize this as a kind of a something for the men. So uh, if we can. And I, I really appreciate what most of these organizations are doing, uh, training uh, women on these uh, key areas. Uh, you find that, uh, like for me, pursuing my undergraduate program in renewable energy, you found that there wasn't much of the practical work or what I was studying, uh, I was studying in school. Uh, there wasn't uh, much of showing how really solar works uh, how really can I connect a solar power system so that it can provide lighting to our own? It was more of a theory work. But uh, and that's the same case in most of the schools in uh, most in Africa today. Uh, you find a young person coming out of school without the necessary skills to enter the job market. And this limits, especially most women, to take a back seat and explore other uh, careers like sales and marketing, which is more easier uh, for them to engage in compared to the technical aspects of uh, uh, renewable energy. So you find them changing route from what they pursued in school to other courses which are more easier for them to uh, pursue. The other issue is uh, if you look at the entrepreneurs in Kenya, most of them were involved, let's say, in uh, especially uh, operating or uh, managing businesses around the technical aspects of uh, uh, renewable energy or supporting the distribution of these components of renewable energy technologies. Most of them have to import those technologies from other regions, making them, if they're, they're able, like making them not be much aware about these technologies. If we can have like, uh, local manufacturing of uh, technologies and also have centers which have these technologies available where assembling of these technologies available not only to uh, men but also to women to interact hands-on with these technologies can help a lot uh, with the uh, uh, women and getting more involved and uh, understanding uh, much better about uh, distributed energy and systems technologies and it can also it can not only improve access to energy but ensure that uh, past uh, the project implementation phases these communities are able to uh, perform maintenance on these uh, in case there are any challenges involved in the project and it can help in uh, the sustainability of the project uh, the other issue i want to talk about is about uh, how the renewable energy technology or implementation phase does not take care of the needs of uh, women. If you look at the personal protective equipment available today, uh, you will see most of them favor uh, men. Let's say like boots, most of them, the men for men. So it's really a challenge for a young woman who, who is uh, operating this phase to to find, I mean, something which uh, resonates with her. She'll always feel this thing is meant for men, not for me. This kind of work is meant for men, not for me. So uh, promoting kind of uh, this uh, equipment which take care of the needs of women, the overalls, everything used in the, let's say, less solar installation space can, in one way or another, promote women to take up, uh, to see like, uh, this space as one of their sector and a sector they can appreciate they'll be, they'll be involved in. Uh, and the last bit uh, I'd like to talk about is um, uh, beyond the access uh, issue, where we are promoting access issue uh, to communities. Let's not leave other people behind. Let's not make it a men affair or uh, 
let's say, a part of uh, re uh, certain regional affairs. Let's make it a whole community affair where we include every person in the community in the project uh, planning, implementation, and also decision making. Uh, we, if we work to most households in Kenya, if you ask a woman uh, about purchase of a certain equipment, she will tell you, I'll wait for my husband to make the decision or I'll have to consult with my husband. So if we are able to include these, all these people in one meeting where they are able to know decision making is not only made, um, left to the men, but also to the women can go a long way in also appreciating the uh, purpose of women in our community. And in, in terms of uh, promotion of youth, uh, we have so many young people who are interested in pursuing uh, STEM subjects and especially women. And you find in most cases, they are not encouraged, especially by their parents or they face, they are not encouraged by their communities. How can we promote these young people, young women who are interested in pursuing uh, an engineering course, a science course, a technical course, uh, or a course in the STEM to, to be able to know the importance of the course in their lives, not only in their lives, but also in changing their communities. Uh, we, we need more mentorship. We need more online courses, free courses which are accessible and also create awareness locally uh, to ensure that these courses are available to the young women in the rural areas, not only the, uh, in the urban areas. Uh, those who are in rural areas who don't have internet access through programs in the communities. So uh, promoting these online courses, promoting uh, uh, courses which promote uh, STEM subjects can go a long way in promoting more women uh, involvement in the energy sector and in the distributed energy systems. Thank you. Thank you very much, Esther. And yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. Everybody needs to sit, have a seat at the decision-making table, uh, especially the women. Now, let me turn last but not least to Harish, Harish Hande, uh, co-founder of Selco. Uh, we, we all know that women are increasingly, increasingly being seen as more vulnerable than men uh, to the impacts of climate change. And uh, at the same time, we know that decentralized renewable energy solutions can improve lives by providing entrepreneurship opportunities, they create local jobs, and they enhance the overall well-being. So um, what's your take on how uh, can an integrated approach to gender empowerment capture the full breadth of the value chain in decentralized renewable energy? Thank you. Thank you for inviting Menona here to speak. And happy Women's Day to all. Uh, and I'll see good old friends and Christine, I know you're smirking of what I'm going to say. So the question is for me, um, I'm sorry uh, to say that we are not aggressive. Um, and we've been talking about this. And and I think somewhere I was about to tell Rabia, either you take a center base that March is 2023 is a base. And when we come back next year, we say, what have we improved in one year? Because we have to get out of our project mode thinking and, and collectively come and make sure that all the stakeholders, if nobody else is going to solve all the issues that we raised. It is us to solve it. There are barriers. If we cannot solve the bilaterals, the multilaterals, the IRENA, the World Bank, I'm sorry, then who else will solve it? If we're all telling problems, the World Bank tells these problems, the IRENA tells these problems, the uh, 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 we say these problems, Selco says these problems, but somewhere we need to turn around, nobody, nobody else is going to come and solve it. If we were able to send a five foot eight human being to man safely in 1969, we are not able to able to deliver a small baby on this planet, forget moon. And we are not able to do it in 2023. And we are saying the maternal deaths in 2023. And we are talking of sending people to space in a very safe manner. And we're not able to do that. That means something is wrong with us in the middle that we are not able to push it, right? And, and, and if you look at the barriers, it's not about, not about the women. Yes, we have the barriers exist, but what are the solutions to those barriers, right? We are highly timed that we have to talk about the solutions and how do we do that. Simple thing, a lot of the innovations, I'm sorry, has not been happened. For example, if I look at a rice mill in a rural area, which runs on diesel, when, it, when the power goes off, to start the rice mill, not only you need a man, but you need a strong man to start the diesel engine, right? So who has innovated on a gender-centric rice mill? 
hammer, I mean, it's like a blacksmith. Why can't we look at hammer mills that are solar powered or rice mills that are solar powered that suddenly gender comes into play? Pottery making, because of the drudgery, you're not able to do for a long, I mean, it means that society is not able to do for a long time. Why not we go into innovations? Why not we talk about the women have to come in all categories, managers, technicians, entrepreneurs, innovators, entrepreneurs of $10,000 to a million dollars, two million. All these challenges on a matrix are very different. Are we confusing and clubbing everything in one category and, and not coming to a simple solution? What does different sect of women actually need? What are the innovations in blacksmithy? What are the innovations in, uh, for example, rice mills? What are the innovations that the 40% of the poor women actually look towards a livelihoods goal. It's not about solar panels and batteries. It's about the innovations in livelihoods that needs to happen, which are gender centric in many ways, right? That needs to happen. Financing, how are we doing financing in, in, in just a simple thing? Do you know when people said, okay, what will Selco do? And it was a question that we asked, uh, Christine. It was, we, and we said, let's pick up the most conservative area in, in Karnataka where people say women don't come. And, and what we did was we did a marketplace of the bankers and technology providers of rice mills, pottery making, roti rolling machine and bankers of different financing and say, we are going to the most conservative part of Karnataka, put it out in the newspaper. We are going to put transportation services. Anybody who's interested in a hundred kilometer radius, come, we are going to do a two day workshop. You, if you are interested, you're going to go out with a loan. You're going to go out with a product. You're going to have, and we had 200 women champions who are already doing, and we created targets for them that you have to bring two more counterparts for the meeting, two more counterparts. And just if I'm allowed to share, uh, uh, share the screen one second, uh, and, and I'll show you the photograph. The, sorry, sorry, this is different. So look at, all are women entrepreneurs who wanted to start a business, 200 of them existing champions, 650 people landed up. We to don't start. see your screen yet, Harish. I mean, we don't really need the picture because you are very convincing as you speak, but uh, oh, we okay. still see the International Women's Day picture. Okay, so I'm saying... Now, now we have it, yes. 650 women came for the uh, marketplace of finance and marketplace of technology. So if these yes. exist in the most conservative part of Karnataka, all left for the whole two days they had come in, that means there's potential elsewhere. We And, and now out of the 650, 410 are entrepreneurs who are taking business. Some are $10,000 and some have reached $100,000 business. And we facilitated the financing to happen and said, why? And then we asked philanthropic capital to put in guarantee into the financial institutions and say, you put a guarantee. If they don't pay, you, your money will actually get into as a guarantee for the bank. Now the bank is saying, I don't need a guarantee because the payments are fantastic. We now need to talk about solutions. And the last, last thing just I want, I want to put up uh, before I, I, I uh, this one is, in the in what for me the scarcity part is for me the scarcity part was in 2030 who are the potential champions that means you have to catch hold of 14 year olds 15 year olds and the 16 year olds right today for a 2030 basement that we have to do so we started a program last year on march 8 2022 of having 25000 sustainability girls by 2025 and 10,000 women are entrepreneurs by 2025. So they're ready by 2030. We have to talk in those numbers and no longer in projects. This project, that project, that's, that era is over. We need to now talk about 25,000, 50,000 collectively, IRENA, the World Bank, the IFC, all of us together and say that in by 2026, are we able to impact 100 million women? And that's how we do it. All our collective stories have to go through, great. But if that needle does not move, I think the next generation is again going to tell us in 2030. Because today, frankly speaking, if I had given you a presentation of 1990, nobody would have noticed. <laughs> and that's my point. Thank yeah, you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this very, uh, indeed, very uh, convincing and, and, and very true statement that we need to go to scale. 
and uh, and we kind of you know need to take all our ideas collectively uh, and see how we can uh, scale them up for for really uh, making making a difference and and so uh, I'm conscious of time. Uh, we still have uh, a few minutes left, so I would throw this question at to all of you. Uh, yes, Christine, before I, I would just basically say, what are your ideas? What can we do to scale up to support women's access in the DRE field uh, to go quicker? Which partnerships between government, private sector, civil society? You you start uh, and whoever wants to come in from the panelists, please take the floor. But this will be your, so to say, already the closing round. Over to you, Christine. Great, thank you. And I'm always pleased when Harish goes at the end because it's very difficult to follow him when he goes at the beginning with with what he has to say in the experience, but a couple of comments. He made the statement about being gender centric. And I think that's something I've taken on recently the role of program director at the Shine Campaign. And one of the things I've realized is we are working hard, we're not done, but we're working very hard in the energy space about mainstreaming gender and gender training and so forth as we've heard today. But where I think there's a big opportunity, and this goes a bit to what builds on what some of the other panelists and Harish certainly has said, is we need to take energy into gender. We need to look at what's happening within women's movements and within gender justice. And we need to bring energy there as a solution. We need to be more communicative about how energy is a means to an end of what those who are focused in gender centric are trying to achieve. And I think that's an opportunity for us to, and again, something I heard from Harish a long time ago, we have to stop talking to ourselves and we have to start looking much more cross-sectorally. This is a holistic issue, an ecosystem issue. This isn't just about energy access. And so I, I just wanna throw out there that I think that's an opportunity for all of us in the energy space to stop speaking to ourselves Think about where are we where are we able to take the work that we've done, which frankly is really just seen in a somewhat dismissive way at times as a technical solution, as opposed to what we've been speaking about today as channels and solutions that meet the objectives of what other sectors are trying to achieve, whether it's food security, maternal health, gender-based violence. There's an opportunity for our work to be positioned that way. And I'm, I'm hopeful, I'm still new to thinking about it this way, but I am hopeful that that is also a path upon which we can get to scale and accelerate more finance coming into the work that we're all doing. Thank you, Christine. Uh, be gender centric uh, and move uh, and turn twist the conversation around. Any other uh, suggestions? Anybody wants to go next? Yes, Tipti, please. Yeah, I'd like to highlight the role of local practitioner organizations. Selco India and Selco Foundation's work is phenomenal because they've been based on the ground for so long, learning, iterating, innovating. And there are others like them in various corners of Asia Pacific, many in Sub-Saharan Africa that we haven't even identified, and Latin America. And Met several of our partners are doing phenomenal work and have been for the last three decades, but still rely on project to project grant. How, how do we transform them into the movement that Selco, for example, has created? Thank you, uh, Deepti. Chiara. Yeah, um, I think sort of in the same spirit as what um, Harish and Christine were saying, you know, I think a lot of sort of traditional approaches to um, women's empowerment right have have focused on changing women right to meet the certain criteria that we would define in terms of sort of like these patriarchal patriarchal systems that we've created in the world right and so I think and as we think about you know like how do we think at scale how do we think at a systems level too right that there's questions we need to ask ourselves about how are we thinking about changing institutions to meet women's needs versus asking women to meet the sort of definitions or criteria that might be you know found in traditional sort of um access to finance issues right like we know that women don't always have access to collateral so rather than trying to think about ways for them to prove that like how can we 
ask these institutions to think more creatively, more out of the box to really um, deliver for them. Because we know that when they do, right, we see the impacts, we see the gains, and we can see the benefits that this does for them and their families, their communities. Um, so I just encourage all of us to continue to think really big and broad and to not feel I think overwhelmed sometimes by what feels like an inex or inextricably large challenge. Thank you. Uh, yes, and 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 really remember that there is not, it's not only us being there, but there is a we as a community uh, by connecting the dots have just a much more leverage. Avishek, please. Yeah, I just wanted to say, like you know, when we are talking about uh, the solutions and why it has not been adopted and scaled. Uh, you know, my we, we my thinking is slightly different. You know, we are need to take a different approach because all the entrepreneurs are not homogeneous. The the area they work, the site are not homogeneous. You know, there there's different characteristics of the sites. There's different uh, you know uh, skills with the entrepreneurs or or their access. So it's really really important to understand, you know, the characteristics of the site, you know, is there appropriate infrastructure? Is there market opportunity? Do they have the skills? Do you have the access to finance? And then you're looking at, you know, like what kind of opportunities are there, you know, to design those tailor-made and targeted interventions to scale those, those technologies or, you know, like entrepreneurs or enterprises. So I think this kind of holistic set of mind frame needs to come into, into you know, like developing you know, these kind of interventions. Thank you. I think, Harish, you want to directly reply maybe to Abhishek? Raise your hand. I think that, Abhishek, that's exactly what I think Christine and me are making. We are saying that we are not, we are we are saying that how do we standardize the financing barriers and all? For example, if the banking system, if the technology side, and then you create the customization at that level, right? We are not telling that, okay, you're going to scale up the, uh, the roti rolling machine guys and, and the sewing machine. What are the basic processes that can be scaled up? Can, can like for example, NABA, the National Bank for Agriculture Rural Development, create a $100 million fund for financing women entrepreneurs below between $10,000 and $20,000? That can be scaled up. And what can be customized within that? See, the question is, I'm telling, processes need to scale up. The customization needs that entrepreneurship. And that's how a lot of the entrepreneurship actually happens. And, and for looking, because my frustration, Abhishek, is, from 20 years, it has not happened. The mover is, so I, I'm, I'm going to put the funders on the table here. Either you make funding extremely flexible and don't ask about impacts right now, because you don't know the impact of, uh, what is the impact of an airport? I have no idea, but you are able to subsidize the airport. None of the airports in the world are, are profitable, but you put in money, 100 million women put in cash of this, like 10, 15 funders getting together, put in $100 million, high risk, high failure fund to make sure that in next five years, what do we learn and how do we move the needle? It will completely change exactly the mirroring of the angel investment that happened in California for the IT industry to come up. We need to get hundred million to $200 million for high risk, high failure, no questions asked funding, which will spur completely rather than this log frames. How will I measure log frames for an impact for a women that will happen in 20 years? Did you put a log frame for an airport? which never makes money. Uber never made money. There's no log frame for Uber, which never ever will make money. It's the largest not-for-profit. So the money exists, Avishek. My question is, we need to be people who are talking about gender accountable right now. And the money's accountable right now. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we just made the call for a $100 million fund to, to to support women in, in DRE. I think that this uh, was quite a productive uh, webinar. I look at Carol and Esther, you still wanna come in? Or is, is it fine for you? Fine, Carol, Esther? Yes, all good. Then uh, I would like to really thank this panel for uh, your all your, your remarks and your suggestions and contributions. It was really uh, outstanding and the, at the time just flew by. And uh, I would just then give back the floor to Celia Garcia uh, Banos from IRENA for her closing remarks. Thank you very much, Christine. Thank you everybody for joining in this amazing discussion. A lot of things were brought up, a lot of things that I think we all agree, I'm sure the audience as well. And uh, just to, to close, uh, highlight that 
all powerful all GWNet arena will keep working and are committed to to keep on uh, not only promoting raising awareness and keep working on the fight for gender equality and uh, that stay tuned because more work will come in the next uh, months. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining. Bye.